means is it was deposited under salt water. It was deposited under water at the time that sea level covered this much of the United States. That's, 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 that's really spectacular. So what happened? If, it, if it's not all glacial ice that does it, let's take a look at this. This is called a mean sea level curve. Now today, that dashed line represents where we are today. If, you're, if you've had any courses in geology, you will recognize these periods in time, Cambrian, Ardish, and Silurian, and Devonian. More importantly, here's the time scale. The Utica was deposited about 455 million years ago, right in here like this. Just for the fun of it, I put the Marcellus right in here like this. But the reason for showing this, largely, is that the Utica was deposited during a period of time in which the sea level was 220 meters above present sea level. Remember, glacial ice can only take us to 67 meters. So what did that? Uh, it's also remarkable right in here. You notice even when the Marcellus was deposited, the seas were about 100 meters above sea level. So the Marcellus, you can say, well, that's all glacial ice. It's glacial ice plus a little bit. And there's another mechanism. But what happened during the Ordovician is this. This is the present ocean floor, and these colors right here represent the age of the ocean floor. And the green right here, these, these are equally spaced colors right here, but there's one green that's very wide. That represents seafloor manufacturing or seafloor spreading of mid-Cretaceous, somewhere in the Ordovan, about 80 to 90 million years ago. 80 to 90 million years ago, Sea, sea floor spreading was very rapid, and this shows up in the Pacific plate right in here. But what happens during rapid sea floor spreading is that ocean crust is created at mid-ocean ridges. So these are mid-ocean ridges right here. All of you saw Hunt for Red October, and remember Hunt for Red October, that submarine was trying to get away from the uh, Tupolev, which was the torpedo submarine, by going right down the mid-sea rift right in here. Remember, the one scene, they had to make a sharp right-hand turn to get away from that torpedo that ran into the wall of the mid-ocean rift right in here, like this. Well, if seafloor is created very rapidly, the ocean, uh, sub-ocean lithosphere right in here gets very warm, and that lifts the ocean lithosphere high, and that displaces sea level, and that's what happened when the Marcellus was deposited, which is that the, um, spreading rate of the globe, global plate tectonics was very rapid, and the mid-ocean ridges were lifted very high, and that pushed a lot of water, a lot of seawater on the continents, and that was a condition that led to the deposition of the Marcellus, or not Marcellus. I have Marcellus on the brain. I just think about that all the time. And it's actually um, the Utica that we want to talk about. Okay, we have a stuck thingamajig here, so I may have to go to this. Let's see what happens here. If I can hit enter. No, that doesn't work. If I go that way, that, that'll work. We'll see if we can figure out what's the matter with that. All right. So, um, you know, <laughs> it works when it goes up. All right. Back again. I, you know, technology, it just drives a faculty member nuts. Uh, all right, so here we are. This is what the Earth really looked like, the entire globe. There's the equator right there. Here's Potter County. There's the Utica being deposited. Um, in terms of its position right now, uh, if we put the Earth into its present coordinate system, so the Potter County now is, is aiming to the north, you can see way back when the Utica was deposited, first of all, Potter County was in the southern hemisphere, and secondly, the north, I don't know which direction north is, I think that's north right there, is that right? North is this way? No. All right, north, I, there, there's no consensus there. <laughs> Come on, you, you guys live here, don't you? Yes, there's an authority. Yeah, he says that way. But in, well, no, that's not right. Up has always been up. <laughs> North is, is it, no, you notice here, though, if I pointed in that direction, I was in the time that the Utica was deposited, I'd be pointing closer to east than north. So that's, that's, that's what's happened with plate tectonics. So here we go. Uh, just as another version of the sea level curve, zero is where we are today, and 
Uh, the point being here, here's the time scale. This is order of vision. That's that Paleozoic period in which the unit was deposited right here. Notice the sea level is up, and right towards the end of the Paleozoic uh, Ordovician, the sea level goes down, but it only goes down 67 meters. So here is this is this high is the result of fast sea level spreading, forming glaciers. Glaciers formed there, then they melted, formed, melted. Here's glaciers again. At this point in time, spreading rate of sea level, uh, spreading rate of the oceans slowed down. So then the sea level was controlled exclusively by glacier melting up and down. And there were a lot of glaciers during this period of time. In fact, is what I want to do is I want to go back to this chart and point out right here like this. There is a period of glaciation about 10 million years after the Utica was deposited. And you can see that with that glaciation, the drop in sea level was just about just a little more than 67 to 70 meters. <coughs> Actually, I should say the drop in sea level right here is because glaciers form. Glaciers melt, of course, the sea level comes back up. So you can see a drop. It took 10 million years for glaciers to form of the size that we have. And then the glaciers melted right here. Sea level came up. So it's at, that's at 67 to 70 uh, meters or something like that. Layered on top of this um, very rapid seafloor spreading right in here like this. So that's the story. All right, now, in terms of what we do looking into the future, I've made it, I think, abundantly clear that, that climate change is going to matter. And it, it will eventually require that we change our lifestyle, at least to the extent to which we power ourselves. So the Germans are actually leading the way right now in terms of powering their electrical grid. And they're doing that using solar uh, cells on roofs and they're taking advantage of the wind. The problem the Germans are having is that when the sun shines, they're producing too much electricity. They can't dump it fast enough. And uh, that creates a real problem right here because they produce too much electricity here and not enough right in here like this. And somehow or another, that gap has to be filled. Now, this is, this is known as green energy because it's not producing CO2 as hydrocarbon fuels do. There are three solutions to filling in this gap right in here. This is the night. So it's a day, night, day, night right here. Those three solutions are building large battery banks. It's hypothetical. I don't know of anyone who has any reasonable proposal on how to build large battery banks. The second is building a national smart grid. Yeah, that's right. Let's build something that's going to cost twice as much as the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System and have the tax, taxpayers pay for it. I don't see that happening with the kind of polarization that's going on with Congress. But what I do see as a possibility is that private firms will, on a local basis, build local combined cycle power plants. Now, combined cycle power plants are gas-driven turbines. And uh, I think that the future is going to look like this in terms of the need to, to really sort of reduce the high carbon footprint and yet at the same time enjoy the kind of energy that we have. We like to take hot showers at night. We like to read in bed before we fall asleep. All of that requires lights being on at this time of the night. And uh, this basically is the essence of the Pickens plan. You all know T. Boone Pickens spent I don't know, a couple hundred million dollars pushing this out of his personal bank account. This was his vision. This is also my vision. And I predict that when the Utica is produced in mass in Potter County, um, if that happens, and we still don't know whether it's going to happen for certain or not, but if it happens, this will be the, this will be the demand that it will fill, this kind of uh, bridge. It will act as a bridge fuel for us. All right, now, a little bit of geology in Pennsylvania. There are two source rocks. We've already mentioned them. I can't tell the difference. It's Marcellus and it's Utica. The Marcellus source rock sources a lot of the gas fields in this portion of the state. They're shallow Devonian source rocks. Actually, even in Potter County here, there were some big gas reservoirs. Those gas reservoirs uh, up north in some of those storage fields right now were sourced in the Marcellus. But if we go to the far northwestern portion of the state, we see a lot of deep gas fields. 
and the oil fields. Those are Utica sourced rocks. So both the Marcellus and the Utica have been capable of charging oil and gas fields for a long, long time. And this makes quite an exciting prospect. Ohio. This is a map of oil wells and gas wells in Ohio. And there are four different formations. Their names are Big Lime, Clinton, Medina, Knox, Dolomite, and Trenton Limestone. All of these have been sourced from the Utica. So the Utica is very, very capable of producing hydrocarbon fuels. And so then the question is, but what about, what about Potter County? Uh, this is the same map right here. These wells right in here, going from New York through Pennsylvania down into Ohio, red is gas, green is oil, all sourced from the Utica Point Pleasant. Now you see the word Point Pleasant getting in here. We're going to talk about that as, as well. What about Utica production? Well, let me bracket Potter County right in here by pointing out that range resources within the past month drilled a Utica well in Washington County right here that had an IP. An IP means initial production. It's the amount of gas that flowed in one 24-hour period of time. 59 million cubic feet of gas in one gas well. And I hate to tell you how big a gas well that is when that's produced. You know, when Art and I were drilling for gas up in Allegheny County, New York, if it did 100,000 cubic feet a day, that was a big deal. And so we're talking about a well that is, let me do, do the math now, 100,000, so a million is 10 times that. We're talking about something that's 50 times any gas well. Now, I said Art and I. Art was the one that was drilling for gas up in, uh, up in Allegheny County. It's 50 times larger than Art's biggest gas well. And uh, boy, he got excited when he did that. Oh, we had a different government. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, uh, that was back when you could produce gas from New York State. Right. You know, I, I recommend a couple books for you if you want to read about the Marcellus. One is Seamus McGraw's End of Country. But there's another one uh, just written by a Wall Street reporter named Russell Gold, Wall Street uh, energy analyst Russell Gold. I know Russell, and he told me that, that when New York, what's what's guy's name right now, the governor, is it Como? <laughs> yeah, when, when Como banned fracking in New York State, this guy who works for the Wall Street Journal said, I thought about writing an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal with the title Hypocrisy. Because what has happened is there's no city in the last 20 years to 30 years whose air quality has improved as much as New York City's air quality, largely because of the conversion from coal-fired power plants to combined cycle gas turbines. I mean, my golly, what gas has done to New York State, and yet they ban it. Um, okay, big well. All right, uh, here's Potter County. These are the two shell wells you've read about, and uh, depending on who you read, the shell wells, one of them had an IP of 26 million cubic feet a day, the other one had 11 million cubic feet a day. Now, even back then, we would say 11 million cubic feet. That's just great. All right, you guys, so here we are zoom, zeroing in on Potter County. Let's go on. New York State. Uh, these are wells that have been drilled through the Marcellus shown in yellow and drilled through the uh, Utica shown in purple right in here. There are a lot of really good wells that have been drilled through the Utica right here in New York State. Bear in mind, Potter County is right here on this map. These have played the Trenton Black River and they played the top of the Trenton Black River. All right, now some terminology, just so we're all on the same page of the playbook. The Utica is the famous name for the gas shale. Just below it is a carbonate rock. Carbonate means limestone, largely. And that limestone has produced a lot of gas in New York State. Uh, in fact, the Trenton Black River right here, there's some statements. Actually, I don't want you to, that's, that's too much. I'll just show you pictures. They're easier to read here. So we're back again with the, uh, with the Utica being deposited 450 million years ago. Here's the equator right in here for Pennsylvania. Now I want to draw your attention to this sea floor right in here. Bear in mind, this is all of the United States. You can see Montana there, and here's Arizona, and Texas, and Pennsylvania right here. Now you notice as the sea gets deeper, the sea was deeper in the middle of the Michigan, in the middle of Michigan. That's known as the Michigan Basin. 
And the sea was also deeper right next to this mountain range right here, running through eastern Pennsylvania. Those are the Taconic Mountains, a big mountain range in the Ordovician when the Utica was deposited. And uh, then in between, you can see it got a little bit shallower. Now, I've identified the names of some formations. Mainly, I want to call your attention to the Point Pleasant here in eastern Ohio. So now we have, we have the Utica, and then the Trenton, Trenton Black River is the name for the whole limestone package. But inside the Trenton, then Culling Wood is a name, and, and Pleasant Point is a name for that limestone. I'll introduce that to you. So we're going to now fly down a little bit closer to the surface of the earth during the time in which the Utica is deposited. And this is a complex map. There's Pennsylvania right there. Here is Ohio right in here like this. And what you see are different rock formations. But I want to call your attention to this rock formation right here in the part of uh, covering two-thirds of Ohio, a little bit of western Pennsylvania, and a little bit of West Virginia. That region is called the Point Pleasant. Actually, it sits below the Utica Shale. It's the top part of the limestone we describe as the Trenton Limestone. That's where the really rich source rock is in, in Pennsylvania. Now, uh, up here, these are limestones. These rocks are the Trenton Black River Plate of New York State. This is where a lot of really hot gas wells have been produced. And let me draw your attention to the fact that these rocks are all the same rocks. It's just the contact between the Utica and the limestones below it. The Trenton limestones are sharp up in this region right here. So Potter County has this sharp contact. So keep that, that in mind because if you go down here in central Pennsylvania around State College, the contact is gradational. The reason that State College is important is we can see these rocks 